Jesus, we worship you. <laughs> I, you know, really, if I had one thing that I, uh, that I would have done, if I could have done it, it would have been to uh, rent a, a 747, take all of you with me. <laughs> Because you would, you would have seen things that it's impossible for me to tell you. I can tell them to you and you can kind of, you know, look at me like a cow staring at a new gate. And it's not, you know, and I say that in a, in a very, you know, nice way. The nicest way that I possibly could say that. Because it's just a wonder. I mean, it's a wonder. What is this? How can this be? And... Um, it changes you, changes you forever. We love every one of you dearly, prayed for you continually. Um, just got a greater vision for each one of you and how the God, how the God wants to use you in the world and the earth. You, you can be seated. Just, it just. I mean, I, I mean, we could go ahead and just worship all night long, and 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 and, and we need to do that. Worshiping is a wonderful, blessed gift that we have to participate with God in, you know. I've always got many things to say about worship because it's such, so dear to my heart. But oh, it's so wonderful when we bring the offering of ourselves. An offering that represents Jesus. That's worship. An offering that represents Jesus. I can turn this down a little bit. I don't want to pierce anybody's ears. It's wrong to pierce your ears. In any way. I, I take you to people groups. We can take you to people groups. You can actually go there by way of Google. It's going to get a spin on it. They imbibe demons into their, into their being through piercing their body. They bring demons into their being. That's the way they do it. And, uh, and I don't want to pierce your ears with the sound system either. And so I'm, I'm just be, I'm believing the Lord that every one of you will be able to catch the things that the Spirit of the Lord has given us to go and do in the nations of the earth. You can't give away anything that you don't have. You have to experience these things before you can ever get get them. And what I what I want to be able to do more than ever before, what I want to be able to do is help people understand the value of what God wants to impart to you so that you can actually be in a position to be used by God in the way that he's demanding. Because when you consider the state of the nations of the earth, not to even talk about the unreached people of more than 2.4 billion, just talk about the state and conditions of the nations of the earth, especially relevant to the church, when you consider that the church literally is the authority of Jesus Christ in the earth, when you consider that, when you consider that the church is the very representation of Jesus in the earth, when you consider that the church has all power and authority in the earth, and you look at it and that the church is supposed to baptize all nations and make disciples out of all nations, that's radical. And then you look at the condition, you go, we, we, we've got to change. Look, we just got to change. So let's just start from the beginning. If you start from the beginning, we're looking at a relationship with God 
that is one not in this realm, but in another realm. Mm -hmm. When I left, the Lord told me to go with a message. I think I actually told you the message before I left. The opportunity to step off the pages of your life and to step into the pages of the Bible. That the Bible stories aren't about just about the events that people experienced in their walk with God, but it's an invitation to all men everywhere to come step into the same realm. And now through Christ Jesus, the door we have access. But it's been all messed up. It's been mingled with the world. It's been mingled with the cares of this life. It's been mingled with the deceitfulness of riches. It's been mi mingled with our careers. It's been mingled with all of our earthly cares and affairs. If you be risen with Christ, set your heart, or affections on things above, not on things of this earth, is the principle that we're going to have to get if we're going to make a difference. Okay? You know, and just grabbing a hold of relationship with Father in that way, the way that He created Adam to have a relationship with Him, to walk around in the Spirit, to walk around in the heavenly realm, getting that principle, getting this next principle of worship, understanding that every sacrifice that was ever offered typified Christ. Therefore, if I'm going to worship, every bit of the offering that I bring through that worship must be an offering that is perfect right. and that typifies Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And God, um, God gave us the capacity. He said it, John 4, verse 23. He gave us that capacity. Mm -hmm. Neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the right. Father, but in spirit and truth. Father seeks those who worship Him in the Holy Ghost. And in truth, that's a changed heart. That's a changed life. Mm -hmm. That's an empowerment, a divine empowerment. Yeah. If I could impart to people in the United States of America within the influences that I have to understand how to cooperate with God, you can go change the world. I was, at, I was in Tokyo, the large city on the planet, 28 million people. I'm looking at what man has accomplished. I mean, some of the biggest structures on the planet. 47, 48 stories high. Beautiful. In, so much money. So immense in size. And then to discover, when I came into town, I said to the pastor, I said, so, because um, the Lord allowed us to go on the platform of the nations. It wasn't just some small church, so on the platform of the nations, which I didn't even realize the scale of it when I left. And, and so I, when, I, when I was there, I mean, these are the people that invited Benny to come there, that invited Carlos Anacondia to come there. I mean, just the list goes on. And, and I, said, I said to the pastor, I said, so how many people, how many churches here in, in, uh, in Tokyo? I said, it's the largest city of the, uh, on the earth. How many churches here? Oh, about 2,000. 2,000? I said, there's 2,000 in our, about 2,000 in my little town uh, in San Diego. And, uh, you know, it's pushing it to have 3 million. I said, those must be big churches. He said, no. He said, actually... The average size is 20 to 30 people. So I went to bed with that that night going, my goodness, what's going on? What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, Lord, why did you send me in Japan? Why am I here? Because I'm, in, I'm wiping the sleep out of my eyes from, from Nepal and, and, and South Korea. If I would have been thinking sensibly, which I usually don't, from the perspective <laughs> of what's reasonable and, 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 and logical, I would have never gone to Japan. I wouldn't have gone that long. I mean, it was just already worn out by the time we got to Japan. I said, Lord, why did you send me to Japan? And the Spirit of the Lord began to impress me, inspire things in me. And all of a sudden, I spoke this. And I said, what if Japan took its place in the kingdom of God and went and conquer, conquered all of Asia for Jesus? Because when they went to conquer the earth, when they went in World War II to take up their conquest, I mean, they started overthrowing the superpowers of the world in days and weeks. They were just sweeping uh, Asia and the South Pacific. And so, you know, I'm just agonized. I'm telling you, I'm agonized. I'm going, Lord, I mean, Lord, I'm going to tell you honestly, you look so teeny tiny here. And the devil looks so big. I said, Lord, you look totally powerless here. You look totally powerless here. Because I'm just, I'm just, that, I'm, I'm, that's the way I am. I mean, i got to have faith to be able to see things. Because look, this is just messed, this is messed up. How can this be? You know, and I'm saying this, I'm saying this, after having gone and visited the churches. I'm going, Jesus, help us. Lord Jesus. These are the top churches? This is, this is it? Here, here we are, we're right in the flow now, huh? This is what you got. 
This is what represents the fullness of the throne room. This is what represents the fullness of the power of God. This is it. I didn't say that to anybody. I was really nice the whole time, wasn't I? I just talked about signs, wonders, miracles. I just talked about the gifts of the Spirit. Talked about the goodness of God. But just thinking, my goodness gracious. I mean, I thought we were messed up in America. My goodness, this is mess, messed up. And so, I mean, I'm agonizing. The Lord spoke to me. He whispered something to me. It's changed my life. Early in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, over there, we live in tomorrow. This is yesterday, so. <laughs> but forgetting all of that, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the Lord whispered something to me. Whew. Oh, God, it changed my life. And if there's anything I'm going to preach for the rest of my life, and by the help of the grace of God, model and see people raised up in, it's this. I'm looking at this landscape and condition of Japan, specifically Tokyo. The Lord whispered this to me. He said, all power and authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Five o'clock in the morning. Mark, I have all authority in heaven and in earth. I'm just looking for someone to agree with me. I'm just looking for someone who really, truly believes that. Who will believe that and grow and to mature into the authority of it that I have now given to anybody who will believe. This is why I've given divine power. This is what the church is all about. And this is how the Lord's talking to me. It changed me. I'm just changed. Now I'm looking at Tokyo going, okay, I'm going to come back here. There's how big, is, how big a stadium? 60, 70,000 people. No problem. We're going to fill the thing up. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus has all power and all authority. Amen. Satan's not, God's not really teeny tiny. God, <laughs> Satan's really cute, gigantic big. Huh? True. Amen. Benny Hinn went to Japan and pushing it, there was 2,000 people in the meeting, pushing it ex with a little bit of evangel you know, evangelistically speaking, 2,000 people. There's probably more like 1,000. Carlos Anaconda went there, maybe, maybe 1,500 people. Just on and on. I just, I, mean, I just got all the statistics from the folks who did the meetings, who kept the budgets, talked about the dollars and the cents. Look, you know, I'm, I'm the bookkeeper. Father, how do we change this? Why am I even here? How can I make any kind of an impact? What? I don't even want to be here. I told the Lord, honestly. I don't even really want to be here. So it's total abandonment. You know, Lord, I, you know I'll say anything and I'll do anything because I'm not interested in being invited back. <laughs> I have no ambition here. I have no cause to be here. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the beautiful thing about it is when we really step out of the way and truly ambition's not there, nothing, it's just, Lord, I'm here for you. I'll, do, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll go to the cross. I'll die on you. For you, it doesn't matter. I just whatever. The Lord can really begin to do things through our lives, right. and the nations that are opened up to us. And Japan doesn't want us to leave. Do we have to go? Do we really have to go back? Is really essential. The need that there is right now in that nation is is. I mean, we we. I, I said it. what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up every possible evangelist. That I, pos that I can. I'm going to influence every evangelist that I can. That carries with them a divine authority to walk in the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to walk in the anointing of your favorite minister. <laughs> Not to walk in the anointing of T.L. Osborne. Not to walk in the anointing of this thing and that. To walk in the anointing of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to walk in the anointing of Elijah. Mm -hmm anointing of Jesus Christ. And the Lord just showed me that the key to that is recognizing that he has all authority in heaven. We can do that. We can do that. Not a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. Because that's out of sight, out of mind. Right? You, that's where you're at. Now we recognize. But how about all authority in earth? Now all of a sudden, thing changes. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden, responsibility comes to bear and you go, as they say in Japan, really? <laughs> oh, really? Does he speak English really well? Oh, really? 
Yes, really. I promise you. All authority. All authority to grab a hold. To grab a hold of this. How many times have I read Matthew chapter 28, verse 18? How many times have I read Matthew chapter 28, verse 18? I read Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, probably for 54 years. That's how long I've been alive. I mean, for a couple of years, I was not really that conscious of it. But nonetheless, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go. You go do it in my name. In my name, go do it. But then, we, but then we come up against opposition. We come up against bad experiences. And we come up against personal defeats as it's seemingly personal defeats. And we start drawing back. Huh? We start compromising. We start believing another gospel. We start adding to the Bible and taking away from the Bible. Because it can't be this grandiose. It can't be this big. It can't be uh, this awesome. There can't really... Ha be given to us that much power and that much authority. A little bit of power, you know, to run around, shout, Holy Ghost, praise God, heal a couple of people, whatever. Yeah, but all authority is given to me. Go make disciples out of the nations. Wow. Radical. Wow. So... I mean, I, I'm not going to start talking to you about all the nations that we've been invited to and the platforms that we now have, that is God's, the doors that God's opened. I have so many doors opened unto me that, once again, all the Lord showed me is that the, ma the master's plan is that we go raise up people, that we go, in, we go and begin to make disciples out of the people that we're able to teach and minister to, lay hands on, guide in the ways of God. I mean, I think probably one of the biggest tricks that Satan could play is getting us spinning it around in a little circle, basically trapped in a ditch of chasing the same thing over and over and over again when there's a vast, huge, gigantic world out there with seven billion people in it standing there desperately looking for Jesus and nobody's telling them. You know how easy it is for people to receive? Because the church in, church in Japan is dead. No, re not really. As soon as the anointing walked in there, they came alive. <laughs> they, were, they were alive. They were just, they were, like, they were like sponges soaking every drop of the presence of the Lord up. It's beautiful. No, they're just stuck. They're stuck. But as a pastor, I understand. I understand why you're stuck. I know why you're stuck. I know I didn't tell them. I'm going to tell you. I try to tell you with that which God gives me in his wisdom and in his knowledge, I mean, because I don't, if it were left up to me to try to analyze the situation, we'll give it up. I mean, we'll just all walk out of the building and I'll be the first one to leave. Because it's like, why do this? Who knows what the problem is? Who can figure this out? But when the Holy Ghost speaks to us, when the Holy Ghost speaks through me, I'm hearing him talk to me as well as talking to you. I'm hearing him tell us the issues and the problems at hand, those things that are preventing us and stopping us from moving forward. The issue is, will we hear it in such a way that it impacts us and then begins to change the way that we do things on a daily basis, the way that we think? Will we hear the word of God and let it be living in the, on the inside of us? Because if we hear the word of God and it becomes living on the inside of us, then it will all of a sudden begin to move us in the way in which God himself is thinking. Now we're not going to be living by our thoughts. Think about it. How about living by the very mind of Christ? His thinking begins to be your motivation, your decision-making capabilities, etc. Pretty radical, eh? Well, you know, the Lord spoke to me. Once again, in such a radical way, on a verse of scripture that I've read so many times. In fact, that is, I've read this scripture so many times, I named the church after this verse of scripture. I'm not kidding you. And now the Lord, ping, my eyes open up. I'm in a situation, I'm in a nation, I'm in a nation that by and large, the, their, their ruler, which people would say is their ceremonial ruler, is a living God. A nation literally crippled by the power of sorcery. A feeling that I've never felt anywhere else. And the Lord says to me, as I'm talking to the people of Japan, saying to them, this is what Jesus says. He says, if you will come and abide in him, that means you draw all your identity from who he is. You think of all yourself within the personification of Christ Jesus. If you abide in him, that means that you find all of your life, your meaning, your value, your existence, your purpose, who you think you are, who you believe you are, what 
what you believe you're supposed to do, all in who Jesus is. And then you let his word abide in you, which then becomes your purpose defined, which becomes your vision, your goal, the things that motivate you, the things that causes you to, to live and, and, and be who you are. Then whatever you want, God will do it. But that is a challenge for you, isn't it? Why? Because you're busy all day. You got a job and you got responsibilities and oh, you got all these things you got to get done. Deception. Honestly, it's deception. It's not what Jesus said. He said, I want to tell you, do. I'll tell you what, I'll provide for you miraculous finances in the most unimaginable places, the fish's mouth. I'll provide for you in a way that you cannot even begin to figure out logically. It's not rational. It's not, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with your framework of reference. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. You need to forget about your clothes and forget about your food and forget about where you're going to stay and go do what I told you to do in the kingdom. I have all authority in heaven and earth. That's a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough. I'll talk a little bit more about it tonight, maybe, these things. But for me, it's, it's key. I'll give you the key to the kingdom so that whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. I'll give you the key so that whatever you loose on earth should be loosed in heaven. Would you like the key? You're going to have to agree to some things. I'll give you the key, but you're going to have to agree to some things. Because unless you agree to them, the key won't work. You have to believe that I have all authority in earth. You have to believe that I've given you the authority and the power to be able to function with my authority. That whatever you say in my name, it will happen. Over all principality, power, and might. You have to believe that I've given you such strength, such divine governorship, so that you might be, might be strong, strength of the Lord and power of his might. You want the key? We'll go through all of our logic. We'll go through all of our rationalization will say, well, what about the bills? God didn't give you those bills. You gave yourself those bills. So it ain't even a part of the, it's not even part of the equation. Well, what about us just be taking care of ourselves? And it doesn't even, it's not even relevant. It's not even relevant. It's not even relevant. And if you want to ask the question and you want to go to the Bible for answers, God says, don't take any, don't take any thought of it from here on out. So, but, 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 but that's, 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 time out. You've now gone completely off the edge. You went to Japan completely off the edge. Now you're back here telling us all to quit our jobs. And go into the ministry. I'm telling you, you can't make your job an idol. I'm telling you, you can't put your job ahead of the kingdom. I can't tell, I'm telling you, you can't let the job displace your pursuit for those things which God's called you to do. I mean, listen to your people. You, in agreement together with us, in prayer and finances, sent us. Huh. And the fruits that we now have abounding in the nations of the earth are laid to your account. Hallelujah. But don't start thinking, well, it was my job that did it. Don't do, don't do that. Because the Lord, yeah, he's blessed you with the ability to, to, to do the things that you're doing, uh, perhaps financially, unless it's a trick. Because I know people who are going to make money for the kingdom and they, and they, and they turned old and gray-headed and died and still were just chasing the bills. Because it was like it was a carrot. It was a trick. It was a trick. They kept them always distracted. No, no, no. It's got to be done in a faith realm. It cannot be done in the arm of flesh realm. That's got to be the difference. It's got to be the difference. If your job is a faith realm, praise God. And then you have, to, you have to learn the principles, the spiritual laws of it for it to be a faith realm. How many of you love, enjoyed having a Don and his wife here? And, and, and Don, aren't they wonderful people? Been around a long time. Been around and been, they've been right in the big middle of everything since the, day, since the you know, days of A.A. A. Allen. I told him to come here and just tell you a bunch of revival stories. I don't know what all he did. I heard he did push-ups. But I mean, hey, come on. <clears throat> Hey, it's a wonderful thing to have divine health and learn how to live in divine health and to be a gospel preacher like he's been a gospel preacher, going and stirring people in the faith, getting people to move past their limitations, move beyond their, their human uh, restraints and understand that God's given us an, a possibility. He's given us an opportunity to live in a heavenly realm, to be citizens of heaven right now, to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in a heavenly place. Oh, dear people, I hope tonight 
that you'll hear Jesus calling. I want to kind of, I want to, you know, basically just give you a, 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 you know, a report, a little synopsis of report, but I got to also be just telling you these great things that I know Papa's saying, come do this, come do this, come advance this. I'm seeing this for this church right now. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it for San Diego. I mean, I didn't go get a great vision for Japan or for uh, the nation of Nepal and the other nations that the Lord opened up to us, uh, South Korea, North Korea, Mongolia, the list goes on. I, I got a greater vision for San Diego and we've had to fight a fight. I mean, last time I was here, I said, we're not going to be, you're not going to be meeting back in this place. And then I left. And here you are meeting back in this place because of the war started. The war started over that property. And um, now we're back, at, we're back at where we were when I, when I before I left, I was told we're, the, the contract's ready to sign, the green lights, we've got the green light. Well, we just got, I, I flew back into town. As soon as I got back into town, she emails me, we've got the green light, okay. <laughs> or just the day before, I flew back into Tokyo, or Hong Kong, rather, and I got the on our way back here, got the message from Geneva. We got the green light and we were open to be able to announce tonight that we're going to be in the, having uh, our first services um, in the new building by Sunday. But it's going to be soon because I'm not going to let it up. I'm not going to let it up. See, see, the thing about it is, the thing about it is, is the Lord looks at us and he says, what well, do you want it? And if you're like, oh, well, whatever be the, uh, thy will, oh God. <laughs> the, 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 what, well, then what is his will for your life? That you didn't have to step up and say, wait a minute. His will is you go into all the world and preach the gospel, beginning of Jerusalem, and go after every soul, and with signs and wonders and miracles, execute my authority in the earth. So quit yawning and, and, and being indecisive and get yourself focused on something and run after it with every bit of passion that is in you. Amen. And then God will be there. Father will be there. Father will stand up beside of us. But if we're just kind of nonchalant about it, not, not, not a lot's going to happen. <laughs> Father, we thank you right now for the fire of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ that is upon every person in this place. Today, not one person will be distracted from the things that you want to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. Well, so we're in, you know, a lot to say on that subject, but just kind of moving on. And, uh, well, I will say this. It won't be... Too many more days we'll have the property. And then we'll begin to execute a plan bigger than any plan that you, in, you or anybody you know could afford. But when you turn your attention to recognize Jesus Christ has all authority in earth, and don't just make him with all authority in heaven. I say, wait a minute. He's got all authority in heaven and earth. I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost which gave to me the keys of the kingdom, knowing who he is and then understanding my position and my place in terms of doing the Father's will to represent him in all the earth, beginning right here in San Diego. You know what? It's just going to be radical. It's going to be big. We're going to go, you know, we, we've got, we're called to go after the orphans. We're called to go after the widows. We're called to go after the poor. Jesus, I mean, when you look at Jesus giving the opportunity, saying anyone who believes on me, these works shall he do and greater works. Anyone who believes. You qualified as a believer. Anyone who believes, these are the works that he will do. When, and then, of course, that's John 14, 12. And then when Jesus uh, uh, is addressing uh, the concern of John the Baptist, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, he says, they came to him, are you the one or we look for another? He then described his works. He said, go tell John, blind see, deaf hear, crippled walk. The dead are raised to life again. The poor have the gospel preached unto them, unto them and blessed is he who is not offended in me. Okay, period. That's his works. He said, these works and greater works. This is the way the gospel is advanced. Signs, wonders, and miracles. You don't have to wonder about what Peter preached. We know what Peter preached. They went and got their sick and disease and laid them in the street. So his shadow would cure them. His shadow. We know what he preached. We understand what Paul preached. We, we, we recognize in Ephesians chapter 9, I mean, forgive me, in Acts chapter 19, exactly what he preached. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And the very next thing you see him over there at the school of Tyrannus, what is he doing? He's, everybody's getting healed so much so. The miracle signs and wonders are taking place that they come pull any garment off his body, take it to those who are demon-possessed, and sickness and disease departs out of their body. I mean, we know what they preached. We saw what they did. <laughs> the testimony of what they did. The, the theological notions that would try to somehow take away the power of God from godly living. 
or even worse, you know, take away godly living from the power of God. Either way, I mean, it's absolutely bankrupt when it comes to saying, you know, understanding this word of God in the scriptures and, and what Father has purposed and for you and I to do and the way he's purposed for us to do them. And somebody goes out to do them and all of a sudden it's not working uh, like it, that, that the Bible says. And so now they want to try to alter the Bible because it didn't work out. They went to do it and it didn't work out like the Bible says. So now they want, you know, it's not even an angel that has appeared to them to teach them another gospel. It's just an experience. It was, it was an unrealized expectation. It was a disappointment. And so now they try to re, re, rearrange the gospel to suit their own experience. Nonsense, dear people. God's telling you, you look, you've got to change. You know, most of the suffering and most of the problems and most of the issues that are causing you uh, 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 the, the uncomfortableness and, and, the, and the struggle and the pain that you're going through is God trying to get you to change for the better, not for the worse. Well, I just went through a terrible time. That's God trying to get you to change. Because <laughs> he wants you to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. And when you obey spiritual laws and walk in spiritual principles and live in a heavenly place that Christ Jesus is the door and the Holy Ghost is the access to, it's going to be good. good. It's abundant life. It's all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's every good and perfect gift. I mean, it goes on and on. You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so we go to Nepal. And we, we, we land in Kathmandu. We go to the first church ever built in the nation. It was built in 1961. It's, it's the pastor um, of that church, the person who built it and started the church in 1953. The first church, it is the first church, both in terms of starting a church in, in Nepal and also the building of a church. You know, participated with us in all the things that we've done up to this point. Gathered up a bunch of pastors shared with them the things the Lord laid upon their heart, heard what was going on in their spirit, what they wanted to do. And uh, then we headed for, a, then we had a couple more meetings, headed for southern Nepal. And it was just amazing. Um, we got on the main highway that goes from east Nepal, Duran, all the way to west Nepal, Dungadi. It's, a, it's, it's the road that connects all of the nation to Nepal. Heard about what China's getting ready to do as they're going to put the connecting highway in, which is planned, slated to start as early as next year, and where it's going to crossroads. And we're thinking, we've got all this stuff going on, the crusades going on, all these meetings that I have. I mean, my schedule was just absolutely, it was just, we were just constantly running. There was no, there was no rest. Uh, one pastor said to me, one of the organizing pastors said uh, to me, in Japan, he says, today, holiday. What did that mean? I did not have to preach until seven. I just flew from one place to another, taking a long car ride today, holiday. Oh, very good. What's on the schedule? Tonight at seven. Okay, good. That's the holiday. That's about right. That was the holiday. So I'm like, how do we do? Lord, I know. I, I prophesied it over a year ago that I would find the mission training center in Nepal by October of 2013 and it's all and it's like October the 27th and I'm packed with stuff to do and I mean the crusades it was just praise God I mean there's this one woman she's just, there was many insane so many people that were mentally insane were totally healed it was so beautiful and, and, and that was everywhere we went I'm just I have prayed earnestly Lord I there is such a need uh, for the mentally insane, for the gifts of healing there and for the miracles yeah. there. And, and, you know, we've always seen things happen there, but this time it was just, wow, it was beautiful. It was, we, we get there the first day and, you know, uh, there's some kids playing around uh, where they're putting all of the, uh, you know, stage and everything in. They're playing, and I, I said to my translator, I said, tell him, come over here. He came over, I said, hey, did you guys hear about God coming to your town? I get, I get real big. And they're shaking their heads now. I said, yeah, God is going to be here at noon today. <laughs> I, I, I said, have you heard of the God Jesus Christ? He said, no. I said, yeah, God, the God named Jesus Christ, who is the only God. And they've got, one of them has all of the various different decorations and beads and symbols for at least a dozen gods. So he's the only real God. The only real true God named Jesus Christ is going to be here at noon. Go tell everybody. So they took off, man. Oh, 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 and I said, and he said to, he told me, because I've already met him. He told me he wants to meet you and your family. 
<laughs> so, I mean, their eyes are like gigantic. You know, they take off running. Ah, just, <laughs> they were back that night. One of the kids, one of the kids had severe epilepsy. He fell down four times a day. That's the way he described it. He actually had four uh, epilepsy fits a day as long as he could remember. He was about nine or ten years old. He said, you know, this happens every day of my life. And the Lord totally healed him. And he was up on the platform telling about how he fell down four days, four, uh, four times each day all of his life. And he went the whole day without falling down. And he's, uh, this has never happened to him. And, and, and he, you know, specifically, this is a little Hindu kid who says, specifically, I met the God Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I can't say Lord because everybody's Lord. There's Lord Krishna. There's Lord Baal. There's Lord, 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 Lord. So many gods. All gods are called Lord. I say God. I'm going to say Lord Jesus. I say God because the lesser gods, even men that represent gods, are called Lords. Okay? I could be called a Lord if I was a recognized holy man, which I am. And so, you know, with the Hindus, you know, we make sure that they don't call me Lord. We rele relegate that to Jesus. But nonetheless... God, Jesus Christ, came and he healed my disease. There's a woman, she was completely mentally insane. When we got there that night, the first meeting started, she's crawling around. She would take her fingers and scratch herself. She would pull on her ears, uh, just chew on her tongue. And she'd been doing this a long time. You could tell from the things, you know, her body and whatnot. Just, ah, just tearing at herself, roaring. Ah! And uh, it was so beautiful. I just said, Jesus, hallelujah. And she collapsed. They drug her up on the platform, laid her out on the platform. She sat there and shook and trembled and groaned for a while. But the next day, her face was just shining so bright. She told about how Jesus, came, God, God, Jesus God, the God Jesus Christ, hallelujah, came, set her free. She'd been, she'd been mentally insane all of her known life. And... Uh, there was one particular person that was almost, well, they were completely incoherent to where they were. And the husband brought this woman. She didn't know who she was. She didn't know where she was. She had completely, had completely lost her mind, and they'd been married for some time. And so, I, I, you know, when you're praying for so many people, when you're praying for thousands of people, you know, you don't just, you know, stand, you're going to have to learn how to pray a little bit faster than this, okay? <laughs> Trying to get a breakthrough. You know, you can have faith to just touch, you know. Just by. So that, that's just it. Basically, every once in a while, you, you stop just a little bit. You know, three seconds, four seconds, a long time when you got those kinds of crowds. If you're going to get done that day. Okay. <laughs> and so, I, you know, walked by this, this, this man and his wife. It was completely incoherent of where she was, completely mentally insane. When she was coherent, she was extremely tortured. And I, when I walked by, I just felt this wonderful glory, the presence of Jesus. And so I, I reached up, I just touched her on the cheek and, and just started walking by. I just touched her on the cheek, said, you're, you're completely healed. And went walking by, and her husband reached out, grabbed my arm, tried to pull me, and pull me back. And he said, you need to pray more. <laughs> I said, no, I don't. I, no, I don't. She's, she's healed. See, most of the church and most believers are Thomas. They don't want to say that they're Thomas, but they are. They're not believing enough until they see it. Got to see it first. Why? Jesus said so. And I believe what he said. And because I believe I said, I get his results. Because huh? he's going to get his results. But he's got to have a partner here on the earth. Got to have somebody who believes he has all authority. Got to have somebody who believes, because that's faith realm. That's all that God's going to honor. Faith is only found in Jesus Christ, who is the word. Okay? That the connection, the partnership, the inheritance means that I totally bought into that. Completely, totally, with complete abandonment. That's true. And that's the way it works. No matter what I see, no matter what I feel, no matter what I experience. And my, does that ever get tested out on you and me? Huh? Well, uh, and the Lord's saying, how do you feel about my, your relationship with me now? You prayed, nothing happened. When I said, if you ask anything in my name, Father will do it. Now how you feel? Huh? <laughs> Hello? That's where people go change the Bible. They go change the Bible. Well, it can't mean that because I prayed that and it didn't happen. You know what? <laughs> You're not the definition of all the will and, 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 and the purposes of God. And the Word of God is the definition of all the will and purposes of God. You're going to have to come into agreement with Him, recognize things got to be adjusted in your life. You're going to have to grow. 
we come into the things of the kingdom as newborn babes. And if we'll, if we'll hear and obey, we'll grow and mature right into the fullness of the measure of the ministry of Jesus Christ, even unto a fully matured man. If we'll hear and obey. But it's going to cost you something because what it's going to cost you is your securities. It's going to cost you those things that you hold on to, those things that you clutch, those things that you really believe on and in in this earth, especially when it comes to the arm of flesh and how it is that you're going to take care of yourself. Huh? Hello? Are you with me? How way the, the whole financial structure of the kingdom of God is entirely different than the financial structure of the kingdoms of this world. And that is a huge adjustment to make all by itself. <laughs> Most people don't even want to go there because it's too scary. Because now I've got to trust God for my daily bread. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now I've got to learn to walk in faith in every realm. Yeah. Every day is walking upon a stormy sea with absolute power and authority over all the physical realm when your eyes are on Jesus and you're hearing his word <laughs> that proceeds out of his mouth. Bid me to come and I'll walk there too. It's a different realm. He said, come back and pray more. I said, look, I said, she's healed. He looks at her, he looks at me, he looks at her again, <laughs> he looks back at me, he says, no, she isn't. I said, yeah, she is. He went through the whole routine again, look at her, look back at her. I said, and then, I mean, and I was going to move on, because I didn't stand there and argue with him. You'll find out tomorrow, I know today. And, uh, but then I just, I got apprehended by the Lord. I said, here's the problem. And it's not just his problem. Of course, I didn't say that. I'm, I'm saying it now so that you can recognize. I'm personalizing this. I'm telling you these stories. Not to benefit me in any way. But to simply to help you understand a little bit more about our own needs. I said, here's the problem. You're looking into an earthly realm. I said, I'm looking into a heavenly realm right now. I see Jesus Christ. I see what he's doing. I feel his manifest power and presence. I know why I'm sent here. He said, go everywhere preaching the gospel and I'll come confirm my word with signs and miracles. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, behold, I'm with you always. Even He's here with me right now. And uh, my, so it was just on and on. I mean, to, to continue to tell the miracles should just be more than I could do in a single night and get everything else done. The Lord's just so gracious. And it really has nothing to do with me as a person other than the fact that I'm willing to just go take the risk and do it. Just because I'm willing to say, I'm willing to respond to the urgings of God. I'm willing first to respond to the word. I hear the word. I believe the word. And now the word that I believe becomes faith in my life through relationship. Because the devils believe and it doesn't matter for any, it doesn't count them nothing. That's what James said. The devils believe. What is it, you know, and tremble. That's the manifestation. Well, I believe, I hear the word, I believe the word of God. And then out of a relationship, that faith, Christ in me, begins to work. And then I just go with those things that I'm strongly urged to do. So I said to, I said to um, Sadeep, I said, Sadeep, I said, take me to that orphanage that you were raised in, that you were running around in your underwear five years old. You ran around in one pair of underwear for a whole year until your grandma brought you another pair of underwear to run around in. So he's taking me to this orphanage. He says, he reminds me, he said, you know, the top 300 spiritual leaders of our nation all went to the same orphanage. So all of the top spiritual leaders, of the church of the nation of Nepal came out of this one orphanage. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, wow, that's really interesting. And he had told me about it before, but it's like, okay, yeah, I want to see that sometime. I'm thinking, Himalayas in the mountain, rushing streams. I got all this picture in my head about the things that I want. I get to the place I go, you know, here we are because the power of God just hits me. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> what is this? To discover that the person that they coined the phrase and named the Apostle of Nepal was the one who owned the property. He's dead now. His name is... Prim, P-R-E-M, Prim. You Google that, Prim, and just Google, or just Google Apostle of Nepal, and you'll be able to get a book. Um, you'll be able to order the book. Well, so I said, well, what happened to Prim? And he begins to tell me this, this, this story, the tra tragic story. 
God, he was the first missionary who ever came to Nepal. He was Nepali. He was in the Indian Army. He has an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. He resigns his commission with the military. He's a young man. He comes into Nepal. He spends more than a dozen years in prison for preaching. He has, he commands, the, he's commanding the weather. He's, he's, you know, all these great miracles, signs and wonders taking his life. God gave him all of this very property all over the place. He starts building orphanages and starts building schools all over the nation of Nepal. And then tragedy hit him. I don't want to go into that right now. But I'm standing there looking at this. And this guy like was thinking way in the future. He built the whole thing sustainable, you know. He's got just, it's, it's, it's vacated now. It's just vacated. It's, built, it's just mothballed. It's mothballed. All these buildings. He built a series of aquaculture ponds and had it set up to be able to irrigate 300 acres of crop producing land, just on and on, amazing things that God gave him insight to do. And it goes, it just re, it's crazy. He took, he built the, sept, the sewage system, the septic system to capture all of the methane. That, to this day, you go, if you light the stove, it's from the methane gas from the septic system. Completely sustainable, amazing mind this person has okay and I'm looking at this thing going the apostle of Nepal built this he's dead his son is an alcoholic living in India completely upside down because of the catastrophe that hit his dad I'm like okay where's the torch where is the torch and the spirit of the Lord saying to me you already have the torch I said okay <laughs> <laughs> you get on an airplane now, go find his son. Just say, tell him, what does he want for the thing? Because his son, he, somebody said, why didn't they put it in the church? You can't. It's illegal. To this day, it's illegal. You can't have nothing in the name of a church, a religious group, unless it's Hindu. Everything had to be in his personal name. There's no other way. There's no way to do it in a business form or nothing. So ultimately, his son inherited all the properties, and his son wants nothing to do with the ministry, so it's my fault. So I get there. Some little, some little group from South Korea, because that's what South Korea does. They go everywhere doing mission. Had, had rented one of the buildings, and this is a huge, massive piece of property had rented one of the buildings and they had 10 orphans in there in one of the buildings that's all they were using this this thing used to be a school that could handle the whole area the whole township it's a large township handle four or five hundred students easily house 200 orphans full-time along with all the uh, uh the teachers and faculty and staff so i walk in there and i first they they one of the, the one of the attendees came to me and says, hey, they want you to come in there in the orphanage. They're having a school session. They want you to come in there and pray for them. So I walked in there with Sudeep. I said, you know, I introduced Sudeep. They didn't know him. I said, Sudeep is one of your national leaders. I said, he was raised in this orphanage, and they're, you know, all fascinated by that. Kind of find out they'd all been in the crusade that morning, that earlier that day, or the uh, previous day, rather. I'll get it right here in a minute. I don't even know what day I'm in. <laughs> um, and uh, so I said, how many of you know that you've been born again, your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life? N no one understood. I said, how many of you know that by the name of Jesus Christ, you've been made a new creation, you've been born again, and your name's written in God's book that he knows you? Try to break it down, make it as simple as possible. And of course, Sadiq's a great preacher, he's a great man of God. And he was translating, so I know he was breaking it down. Only two of them out of the ten raised their hand. So I prayed with them and for them, because I believe in praying for people. It's not just about repeat after me. I'm a, I'm a, you can't break the yoke off you. I've been anointed to break the yoke off you. You with me? I try to help people understand this. That's the way Jesus ministered. He went, he was anointed by the Holy Ghost to go open up prison doors, set the captive free. You understand that? Okay, that's the anointing he's given to us. Open up prison doors, set the captive free, break the power of the mind-blinding spirits, speak the authority of the word, and a new creation comes. I mean, we're the miracle people, right? Huh? We're the greatest miracle of salvation, so I'm going to participate in the greatest miracle, all right? 
Huh? I'm not saying, oh, you get your miracle on your own. Huh? Are you with me? I'm going to get after you. I'm going to pray for the miracle, whether it's physical or spiritual or financial. We're going to pray for the miracle. They all had the miracle. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I asked each one of them. I went around the room. I asked each one of them. No. No. I don't know. God knows. Yeah, but he wants you to know too. Next. <laughs> and if you leave it to God knows, then you don't know either. Okay? And you need to know. Just got such a great vision for the place. I said, Sudi, get on your plane right now. Go find out how much he was. And, and, and ask him, what is, it, what is his price? Don't haggle him. He said, well, I'll send the lawyer. So we claim the thing. It's already claimed it's the kingdom of God. You know, wanna, you know what it is? You know what it really is? It's an act of redemption. It's God's. It was bought with church money. The churches of the state of Virginia, Virginia, here in the United States of America, primarily paid for all of those churches that the apostle of Nepal, Prim, was able to, to claim for the kingdom of God. It just, his alcoholic son, because of all the things that happened, the way the laws work, it all passed to him. He's sitting there doing nothing. So we can go and redeem it. And with this, this, the, already the staff that's there and available, I mean, to get, you know, to staff it. It's, it's, a, it's Sudeep oversees it. I'm going to, we're going to publish the beginnings of Sudeep's orphanages. His orphanages started in a little teeny room house that would be about as big as that platform right there. And Elizabeth's making a, 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 a video of it. He had, what did he have, 40 people in there? 40, something like that. He's got, <laughs> he's got of course, the orphanage now is big. Okay, he's got the widow's home. He's got the orphanage just on that one property. This doesn't include all the network of more than, it's more than 500 orphanages. He's got, on one side, he's got the, the uh, orphanage. On the other side, he's got the, the widow's home. And now he's building a new administrative building. Sudeep knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Okay, he's on the ground there. He's got this huge vision. This is the place he was, this is where he was raised. This is where he met Jesus. I mean, and Sudeep is a very honest person. He really does, in every way, dial everything down. He's very, he's very sedate. You know, he's very sober about what he says. He, and he said, I know that Prim would have passed everything to me. Because he was the first pastor of, the, of, of that. At 15 years of age, Prim set him as the pastor, built a church for him to pastor, and gave him... Uh, the place to live in as the, as, the, as the pastor at 15 years of age. He, the mantle was already on. The mantle's on him today. You could, still, you could see the mantle. You don't have to guess. Here's the mantle on. The mantle's on him, man. Huh? Looking at a place positioned in the crossroads of China and India, just to name those two nations, which will have more than 50% of the population of the earth in the very near future, and then a strategic position right down the road is Kashmir, where you will die for preaching the gospel. On the other side of the road, which runs from Duran to Nagadi, the other side of the road is Bhutan. The Himalaya region of India, which is Sikkim and West Bengal. Then down from Bhutan's Burma. So all these things unfolding. These things unfolding. So we're really excited about that. And... Um, just what the Lord's going to do. And we, so we said, I just said, we're buying it. Tell him it's sold. Tell us how much money he wants for it. And we'll get the money to him right away. We're going to redeem this. And reality of it is, is when you believe that Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, when you really make a transition to believe that. Because I know we're all scratching our head. Really? As they say in Japan, really? Oh, really? Yeah, really. All authority in earth. Well, I thought it was all in heaven. He was just in heaven. No, all authority in there. He's looking for somebody to believe him. Someone to agree with him on the level that you're not trapped anymore chasing, chasing your problems, your issues, your future, your purpose like a cat chasing its tail. Tricked and deceived by Satan. But now you say, done with it. I'm off, I'm off the treadmill. Done with it. Done with it. I'm now going to follow Jesus. What if I had... Uh, an invitation tonight 
for you to come and follow Jesus, which means you have to leave everything to come follow him. What if I had that? Many of you would deal with demonic influences when I said that. Fear would strike your heart. It's demonic influences. It's not your rational thinking. It's demonic influences that's keeping you from the best life you could ever imagine. Because as soon as you do, God is now going to be your provider. Ooh, that's going to be a big ch change, isn't it? Huh? Like he's going to be a for real your provider. Huh? Not, oh, he's provided very well for me that I've got this job that keeps me from doing his will. Right? Once again, there's a way to make your job faith realm. Right. Mm -hmm. But there will be proof and evidence that it's done in the faith realm. It doesn't stop you from pursuing the things of the kingdom. Gordon Lindsay was a businessman, but he was a businessman who gave who was a businessman in the faith realm, and look at what he raised up, Christ for the Nations. I just I was just asked to be on the board of Christ for the Nations. South Korea. Well, it's actually Christ for the Nations Korea because it was started by a woman that everyone recognizes as a prophetess of Korea. And she's prophesied and sees a peaceful unification of South and North Korea. Beautiful. She followed us around Japan. We've met her in South Korea. By our God touched her. She had many wonderful things to say to us from the Lord and about us. And then followed us into Japan. And, uh, you know, I just, what I see is the Lord laying the groundwork for this great end time harvest. People, we've got to recognize that the Lord isn't just going to send anybody. He's going to send those who are willing to preach his word. Not to spoil the harvest, not to bring the harvest into some damp silo so it can be all moldy. <laughs> not to bring it into some religious organization so that it doesn't step into the relationship that Jesus Christ died and rose again for us to have. But people who will begin to receive these things, these precious things that have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and brought to us by the Holy Spirit, who will begin to walk it out. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have to walk it out before, here before you can ever walk it out there. Believe me, you're going to get there and you're going to go, oh my goodness, you're going to have to come to terms with your inability, your immaturity, your powerlessness. Your, your need. Why not let God the Holy Ghost show you your need now so that the changes and the adjustments can be made? It's not arbitrary. It's very clearly laid out. Nothing, I'm telling you right now, nothing in the Bible that Jesus said is an option to say, I'm not going to go with that one and still get the res end results that he describes. We, if you, I've said it over and again, if you took Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and you started living Matthew 5, 6, and 7, first of all, your life would be totally different. Second of all, you'd be one of the best people to be around. Because you you're not mad at anyone ever. Because right. <laughs> right? you bless everybody who persecutes you and you love everybody who hates you. Huh? What a great guy or a woman. I mean, what a blessed life. I mean, for me, you know, somebody says, when you get tired, watch out, you're going to make bad decisions. I, not really. Not if that's your law. Your law, you're tired, you're worn out, you're weary, and somebody's being, you know, ornery or, or being treating you wrong. Well, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm blessing. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to love them. So I'm not going to come up with some rash statement on Facebook and tweet some crazy th idea and get back at you, a broad statement, but at the right point, and right at that person who messed with me, or just do stupid things and get yourself relationally in trouble. Because huh? you live by the word of God. I mean, huh? if you abide in Christ Jesus, you draw all your identity from him. You draw all the value and meaning of your life from him. You don't think of yourself of, based upon earthly criteria, but you abide in him and think of yourself based on who he is. If you could just do this to realize you don't even exist outside of Jesus Christ. No, those who do not know Jesus do not even exist to God. They don't even exist. They dead while they live. They don't even exist. They're dead. He that hath the Son has life. That's existence. He that does not have Christ Jesus does not even live. And I'm looking at a lost and dying world who's not even heard. I'm looking at 28 million people in Tokyo going, my goodness, there's 2,000 churches only in 28 million people, and there's only approximately 20 to 30 is the average size. Come on now. This can't stand. And then we went to Osaka. I said, I come into Osaka, 8.6 million people in Osaka. How many churches? 800. 
They must be big churches. No, they, they from 10 to 20. And, and, I, and so I got up and I said, no, I said, they, they around 30. Elizabeth said, that's not what the pastor said, Dad. I said, yeah, but he's got to be wrong, man. How can I repeat that there's, the churches are only 10 to 20? And then it got confirmed to me. Yeah, churches have besides 10 to 20 people. Oh my God. Why? 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 Who's not doing their job? You can't blame Jesus. Jesus is not doing his job. I mean, if God would just send a great moving of his spirit, crossing <laughs> nonsense. Holy Ghost has been poured out upon our flesh. God has empowered us. He's saying, who will believe? Who will go for me? The Lord's saying the same thing as he did in the days of Isaiah. Who will, go for me? who will go for me? But he says it on a higher scale now. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Who will believe? Some of you come in late. I was telling how I was agonizing. I'll, I'll be talking more about this because it was such a life-changing experience for me. I was agonizing over the state of Japan. And the Lord spoke to me wee hours in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and said, Mark, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. I'm just looking for somebody who will believe that. Because believing it is more than just acknowledging it mentally. It's taking a hold of it and saying, okay, Relation, relationally, I'm going to go do these things on your behalf just like you would do them. That's faith. That's faith realm. And so for me, that's what happened to me. It just happened to me. And those things, people, we make a decision. We'll make a consecration and then it'll get tried. It'll get tried by circumstances. It'll get tried by fiery trials. It'll get tried by adverse situations, by disappointments may even, may, maybe sometimes, by things that we don't understand, uh, valleys between the mountaintops that we never saw, whatever. You just got to grab a hold of the consecration. I said from the earliest days of my ministry, take a hold of that altar call consciousness, those altar call commitments. Those things that you know was right there in your face when the altar call was made and you responded to the altar call and you got down on your knees and you said, Lord, from this day forward, take a hold of that now mm -hmm. and live it, live it because you're going to come up against situations that's going to make that as far away from your thoughts and as far away from your motives as the East is from the West. You got to grab a hold of it. You got to put it in front of you. You got to say, This is what I'm going to do. I know exactly what God personally has for me to do because I know what the Holy Ghost began to do and tug on my heart and speak to my heart when I was sitting there in the meeting because that's the only encounter of truth you have. That's it. That's the only encounter of reality that you have. All the rest of it is a, is a, a melu of all kinds of stuff that no one can sort out but God which by and large would be, uh, def uh, be defined as deception because it's truth mixed with lie. It's reality mixed with deception. Listen to me, dear people. God's calling. All, he's, all the Lord has done for me and opening up so many doors and so many opportunities has caused me to see that much greater of a need, to see Holy Ghost people raised up, people of the Spirit, people who abide in Christ Jesus, draw all their identity, the value of who they are, so much so that they see themselves seated in a heavenly realm. They see themselves living out His very existence and allow His Word to abide in them. That means His Word now becomes the very source of their thinking, the very source of their thoughts, their plans, their vision of the future, their motivation, their goals, their wants. It's all drawn out of these things that Jesus spoke. Then you'll ask whatever you will and God will do it. I stood there and I said, Father, after the Lord made these things real to me, I said, Father, I know you've chosen me. That takes the pressure off, doesn't it? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm here because you chose me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I know that you've ordained me to bring forth fruit. And the fruit that you want me to have is that whatever I ask, you'll do it. I said, Father, I ask you in Jesus' name now, let Japan... Find its position in the kingdom of God, its place in the kingdom of God, that it can go conquer all of Asia for Jesus. Now, I, I know the Father answered that prayer because He said so. And I know, that I, I know also that I play a crucial, critical role in the fulfillment of that. Huh? There's no time to go sit around. If, you, if all you want to do is 10 to 100 children, fine, that's good. We need that. If that's all, all you want to do is take care of a couple of, of Bible schools, fine. We need that. That's fine. That's whatever. There's, there's need for everybody.
There's a need for everybody. But right now, I'm busy conquering the world. Right now, I'm busy understanding exactly what God's strategy is to reach 2.4 billion people so that 2.4 billion people can hear the name of Jesus Christ and at least have an encounter of God to at least have the privilege of making a decision whether they decide yes or no. At least they get the privilege and the opportunity which every man should have because their souls will spend an eternity in everlasting punishment. Because they rejected the only means of escaping death and the stronghold of Satan. Satan has sealed the doom of every man. Only Christ Jesus can release it and has released it. We just are committed like never before to training you and commissioning you and holding you responsible. I'm, I'm going to hold you responsible. Amen. I'm going to help you understand. I'm going to give you the tools and resources by the help and the grace of God so that you can go and effectively and actively become involved in the kingdom of God right here in San Diego, right here in the local church. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk about it. We're going to help. Together we're going to, we're going to pray and, and, and help you see exactly what God would have you doing now right where you're at so that you can begin to realize a transition in your life where your business doesn't define who you are, where you do not abide in the identity of yourself and a man-made career and you have the concepts of your own uh, of, of how to do that and how to be successful, which is the word of man abiding in you. You don't have that. Where you begin to make a transition to where all of a sudden you begin to see everything in the value of the kingdom of God. Why you're doing what you're doing in the value of the kingdom of God. How it is that what you're doing is participating in those things that Jesus Christ purchased for us at Calvary and the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do, to go everywhere making disciples out of all nations. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a great inheritance we have in God, huh? Hallelujah. My goodness. Is the only way to live. Amen. Walking around being filled with the Spirit. Don't be, don't be unwise, but be wise. Knowing what is the, redeeming the times. Knowing what is the will of God. Don't be drunk with wine, but be drunk in the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hallelujah. Singing and making melody in your heart. Well, that's, the one, I think, one of the first things that you're, some people are in here are going to have to grab a hold of, one of the first spiritual laws and principles of walking in the Spirit, being in the school of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Being in the school of the Spirit, you came into the school of the Spirit, you were born into the school of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. When the mantle fell upon Elisha, he was allowed entrance into the school of Elijah. Elisha was allowed entrance into the school of Elijah. When you were born of the Spirit, the mantle or the anointing of Jesus Christ fell upon you so that you might come into the school of the Holy Ghost. John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said the Holy Ghost will teach you everything. Hallelujah. And what is it he's going to teach us? How to glorify God the Father. That's how to glorify Jesus. So to, in, in the teaching, he's going to lead us and guide us in all truth. He's going to fully mature us and grow us up into every dimension of everything that Father has so that we might find ourselves living in all the fullness of God. But there's spiritual laws we're going to have to learn how to obey, like keeping yourself in love. Amen. Amen. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and there be filled with all the fullness of God. Because a lot of people, they, they have these challenging situations and the school of the Spirit teaches us exactly what we're supposed to choose. We're supposed to be led of the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and he's saying love. And so, boom, here we go, walking with him in this love, the kind of love that only he can give us the capacity to have. And he gives us the capacity to have by our acknowledgement of what it is he's doing huh? by, our, uh, by our active submission to his will. Here's what happens. So many people stand at the crossroads and they go with some form of hate. If it's not the love of Christ Jesus, it was showed to us at Calvary, it's some form of hate. Are you with me? Huh? It's the school of the Spirit. It's, if you violate the principle in the Spirit, you're never going to be able to understand how to move forward. I want to say this in closing. Mark eleven twenty four 24 is a powerful description of where the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit meet. Okay? Jesus has just said, with a little bit of faith, you can move mountains. Anything you say will happen. Anything you say will happen. Anything you say will happen. 
That's what he says. He said, when you stand praying, believe that you have received it. And whatever you say shall happen. Huh? But while you're standing there praying, and you recognize there's somebody you need to forgive. See how the fruits of the Spirit now integrated with the gifts of the Spirit? Gifts of the Spirit ain't going to work properly without the right kind of response to the nature of Christ. Huh? The value system of the kingdom of God, the love of God. <laughs> Stand there praying, you recognize there's somebody you forgive, you better forgive them because if you don't forgive them, neither is your Father in heaven going to forgive you. And the bottom line is what he's saying, and your prayer is not going to be heard, and it's not going to be answered. And so then what people do is they go change the theology on us because they won't recognize the changes that Father's demanding. And that's just one example. There is no shortcuts. Anybody who tries to come up in other ways, a thief and a robber. We come to Jesus. You come and sit at Jesus' feet. Come on now. Ain't nobody got to govern you with some law. Huh? We don't have to make a phone call, call you up every day, see if you're going to be in church. Huh? Give me a break. Please. Please. Not when there's, there's 2.4 billion people who've never heard and the majority of the earth's population have never really had an encounter with Jesus, they had an encounter with religion. Please stop that. Not when there's how many people in this city and this county who've not even had a chance? Come on. Come on. Let's go after, let's get, everybody ought to have an opportunity. Come on. You sit at Jesus' feet, you're going to want to give people an opportunity. You're going to be willing to die, to lay down your life. Much more, or much less rather, Suffer a little persecution. Mm -hmm. The blessings of God will rest on you when you do. He'll reward you for having been rejected. People, there is an evangelism that needs to happen in our life and in this town. Mm -hmm. It's an evangelism of going and blessing people. Recognizing that people are suffering and hurting. They're, ang they're full of fear. They're full of anguish. Huh? Mm -hmm. Friday night and Saturday night is just a little bit about escaping that. That's all. Don't try to get them when they're trying to escape it. Huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Get them on Monday morning. Monday morning is evangelism day. <laughs> uh, people are hurting. They're in pain. They're suffering. They're tormented. To be able to just look at people and bless them, to give them life, to bless them, to pray for them. Oh, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that like never before, every soul in this place or is going to cooperate with you and recognize, Lord Jesus, who you are. That you reign in the kingdom of men with absolute sovereign authority. That you've been given all authority in heaven and in earth. And you're just looking for someone to believe that. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that the abiding place will step into this wonderful divine opportunity and gifting that you gave us when you named us. Yes. When you named us. Yes. That every person in this place will begin to see that they abide in you. Mm -hmm. And that's their whole life, just abiding in you, Jesus. Drawing their whole existence from you. That every person will allow your word to govern their thoughts. Your word to define for them their actions and what they're going to do with their life. So that we may say your word abides in us. Mm -hmm that we can begin to see the thousands and the tens of thousands of children that can be reached in this city yeah. reached. Yeah. That we can begin to see the thousands and the tens of thousands of lonely widows in this city reached. Mm -hmm. We can begin to see the thousands and the tens of thousands of young people who are just aimlessly wandering about losing their virginity, losing every moral fiber of their being through a reckless, sin-cursed world. Saved. Every dimension, every cross-section of people in this city. Oh God, let, let us be the answer to our own cry for revival. For Father, we recognize that as soon as we obey, we begin to see. As soon as we step out and with the smallest act of obedience, the greatest miracles of faith begin to come. Mm -hmm. Father, may we see today like never before that when you prayed, Lord Jesus, and said, 
The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. You were talking about the context of the miracles, the signs and wonders that needed to take place because of the sick, the diseased, and the tormented, and the suffering that you healed at that same moment in time. Mm. <sighs> Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that the Bible will not be about memory verses of Scripture anymore, but it will be about a call to step yes. into the realms of the kingdom to live out the most glorious life possible yeah. in, this, in this world. Father, tonight I pray that every person would have the wisdom and the insight to recognize that no matter who they are, everything about their life must radically change. That nothing can remain the same except for those things that belong to pure faith. Father, we pray that everyone will look and see what you, Holy Spirit, are desperately trying to instruct us to do and teach us. I break the power of every mind blinding spirit, of every influence of demon spirits and demon power. Father, we pray today that we will be able to renounce ungodliness and bind every unholy thing like never before. Thank you, Jesus. Dear people, I want you to renounce. I want you to grab a hold of something. I want you to understand in a humanistic world, we come with repentance. The Lord accepts us. He delivers us. He changes us. But if we're not careful, we'll be influenced by human thoughts, humanistic thoughts, rather than by the divine word and command of the Lord. And so though we've been born again and made a new creation, we'll allow ourselves to come under the yoke of bondage. Even as Paul wrote to the church of Galatia, coming under the yoke of bondage through religious ideology. Even as he wrote to those, the church of Corinth, who came under demonic influences because of strife and division, choosing leaders for themselves like their culture had taught them. People, if you've been involved in drugs, if you've been involved in alcohol, if you've been in, involved in other occult practices, you need to renounce them. Dear people, you, you, I know we've humanized it, but tattoos is a, part of religious, is a part of a religious cult of other nations. Listen, body piercing is the way that, the way that it came about was a, a means by which demon spirits were imbibed and brought into the body. That's the way it came about. We humanized it, but today they still practice that voodoo. It is, it's the strong, body piercing is the strongest voodoo magic. It's how they do their voodoo magic. They're on the voodoo magic, it's not going to work. The demon will not do what the person is requiring the demon to do until there's various different body piercings going on, especially in the tongue. I mean, this is just reality. And, and I, I say renounce it. I say, I say just, I, here's what I say. I just say, make darkness darkness and make light light. And just renounce everything of darkness. Everything that belongs to that realm, renounce it. All the unholy things in the world, renounce it. Say, I, just with, with a verbal declaration. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I live this in prayer. Every day, Lord, I renounce every unholy, every evil influence. I want nothing to do with the spirit of this world. I want nothing to do with the lust of the flesh. I want nothing to do with the lust of the eye. I want nothing to do with the pride of life. I renounce it. Father, I want your kingdom. I want your ways. I ask you to come and protect me. I ask you to come and keep me from evil. I ask you to lead me in the way everlasting. I ask you to help me, oh God. Without your help, I cannot make it. I mean, find that relationship. Yeah. Prayer. Right. <laughs> that is so real to yeah. you. Yeah. That at any second, at any moment, you can speak it, you can say it. Huh? There are things in me that are so real to me. Yeah. They're a part of me every single day. Find that place. Recognize if you haven't, it's because you've allowed things of this world to take over. And displace Jesus from your life. You can say, well, I come to church. Doesn't matter. That's a beginning. It's not an ending. Do you understand me? It's a beginning. It's a place where you get strengthened and empowered to go do what God's called you to do. It's a place where you get commissioned. Amen. Amen. And sent out. Amen. 
Listen to me, abiding place in ministry. I've been encouraged by the Holy Ghost. The Lord spoke to me, encouraging me, telling me, listen, I will breathe on the place. I will breathe new life. I will breathe strength upon the place. He said, I will give you the, the spirit of the Lord spoke to me. I'll give you the ability. Don't be indecisive. Don't be indecisive. Do not count the money. Don't be indecisive. Make decisions that you're willing to die for. What is it going to take? How can you do it bigger? What is it within the reach of your faith? Right now, I must be honest with you. Qualcomm Stadium is not within the reach of my faith. To possess it, to own it, to feel it. Huh? It's not. I want to be there. I want to be there here in the city. Paul would be there. Jesus is there. But this property right down the road is within the reach of my faith. Huh? I want it to be within the reach of your faith so that you can reach with me, so that you're not sitting. You're never going to be a player on the field of conquest watching from the nosebleed section or even watching from the bench. Huh? It's okay. At least in the bench you were in the, you were in the game during the practice with the hopes of being able to step up and be a part of the real thing, the real deal. Amen? Amen. Come on. But you can't expect to mature and grow standing on the sidelines or sitting in the bench saying, go, pastor, go, go, pastor, do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Here, let me give you some more change or more money or empower you. Look, fine, empower us, okay, good. But don't, do, don't, don't just do that. Come join in. Come join in. To join in, then you have to participate in a, in a, in a, in a way that's a consequence to you. It's a consequence to me. I'm living, in, I'm living and breathing and living and dying this. Huh? I'm in Him. My whole purpose is to live for Him. So I'm thinking... Well, Jesus, how would you do it? Right? How would you do it right now? I'm going to put the biggest opportunity in front of you. Which one are you going to take? Little opportunity, moderate opportunity, or big opportunity? The big opportunity I'm going to give you is the one that I have prepared you in the realm of faith to take a hold of. But what will we do? We'll sit and calculate. You're never going to hear from the Holy Ghost there. You've got to get down on your face and say, Oh, God. I'll go with you wherever you lead me. I'll take up my cross and follow you. I recognize you have all power and authority in heaven and earth. I recognize that you've commissioned us and given us divine ability to reach the lost and make disciples out of nations. Then you can start making the right decision. Because <laughs> that in itself, that prayer in itself, that acknowledgement of God's word is going to take you to a whole nother level of thinking. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The loneliest life that you could possibly have is one that is selfish. It's the most lonely, miserable, valueless life. It's a selfish life. Jesus shows us how to live completely for Him and for the others. It's a glorious life. The decision-making process is how much are you going to participate? Huh? It really doesn't come down to a small decision of whether you're going to do good or evil, walk in sin or walk in righteousness. Those are consequential to much bigger decisions. Are you going to follow Jesus? Are you going to do the works of, the, of, of Christ Jesus? Are you going to walk in the will of the Father? Much bigger decisions. Are you, going to be, are you going to be what He's created you and purposed you to be? Are you going to go with all power and authority? Are you going to have the strength of the Lord and the power of His might? Because every spiritual wickedness wants to stop you. Every governmental power, every high thing. But don't fear. Don't worry. It's just big decisions today. It's an altar call. I don't have an altar up here. I used to have an altar. But you can have an altar right there. The altar of your heart. You've heard me say it over and over again. One man said, Lord, over and again, he prayed a prayer. I built your altar. The wood is laid in order. 
sacrifice is ready. Send you fire now. You have to ask yourself, have you built an altar? That was Evan Roberts. And we know what God did through him. God changed the, world, the landscape of the church through one man. In a, in a very small town, in a very small nation of the earth, Wells. Have you built an altar? A place where you continually worship God? In the Spirit? In the Holy Ghost? Have you laid the wood there? In preparation to a complete consecration of your life to doing the will of the Father? So that you can say the sacrifice is ready? Because <laughs> the sending of the fire? No problem. Papa's already done that, purpose that, set it up. It's words already, words already been pronounced and sent forth. It's done. This is what we'll do. And all the harassing powers of darkness. It's a big world out there. It's a big world. I know how it is. You live over here in this little small, teeny existence of your life. Round and round we go. Grinding meal for the Philistines. Huh? Oh, yeah. Step out there and see it, and you'll recognize how you've really been doing that. Eyes plucked out, can't see. Hair cut off, the anointing of the covenant not in operation. Spirit of the Lord departed, didn't know it. Can't understand why you can't enter in. Can't understand why you're not excited about the things of God. Can't understand. Because you walked away from the covenant. You disobeyed God. Come back. Repent. Do the first works over. That's what Jesus says to his church. He says it. He says, you want revival? He says, you want the fire of the Holy Ghost that will cause this whole nation to tremble and shake with my glory? Repent and do the first works all over again. Come back to your first love. That's what he says. The laws. Don't allow yourself to be lukewarm. Get yourself in the realms of the fires of the Holy Ghost and burn bright with the fires of his presence every day. Father's will it's an absolute Father's will shall be done in your life in such a state. You will never be confined to one place when such a passion exists. When every day it is, oh God, let my life count in the kingdom. Lord, let me step into everything that you purchased for me at Calvary and poured out the Holy Ghost for me to have. It must become the cry of your heart. It's bigger than anything else. Bigger than anything else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Whew. Feel the sweet presence of Jesus. Feel the empowering grace of the Holy Ghost. He's not, he's not holding back from anyone. He gives liberally to anyone and everyone who asks. Anyone, anyone who believes on me. See, Jesus, anyone who believes on me that I have all authority in heaven and earth. Anyone who believes on me that I have all authority in heaven and earth will do these works that I do and greater works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Consecrate yourself today, right now. Consecrate yourself. Turn away from all the affections of this earth. Turn away from them. Turn away from them. Turn away from them. Let me tell you what, young people, younger folks, when you hit the dial of 50, especially you hit the dial of 60, and I've told 70, you start looking on your life going, what have I done with my life? I pursued the wrong things. Listen, I, Ann and I were exhausted the other day. We were so exhausted. Ann doesn't sleep. She just does not sleep when we go places. She doesn't sleep. She's such a light sleeper anyways. I'm looking at her totally exhausted, and I wasn't too much better. <laughs> I said, listen, baby, our life is going to be over. And we cannot run the risk of thinking for one moment in those last few moments of our life that we could have done more. I cannot run the risk. I don't care what it costs me. I cannot possibly run the risk of being at that moment, the most important critical moment of my entire existence when I pass from this life into the next, saying I could have done more to reach the lost. I could have done more in obeying the call of God because you're not going to stand there and t convince him that you tried to do it and it didn't work. Huh? 
<laughs> Everything at that moment, all the stuff that stood in the way, all the hindrances that we don't have the wisdom to see or are unwilling to have the insights to see will be apparent. It'll be just right there in front of us. There'll be no more deception, no more lies, no more games, no more playing justification with ourselves. I can tell you what you're going to see. Your life in contrast to the Word is what you'll see. No, no surprises. No surprises. Isn't that beautiful? No surprises. No surprises. I saw a person with no limbs. I said, oh Lord, I want to speak the Word of faith. The Spirit of the Lord said, just stand and continue to do what you're doing. Huh? We try to jump ahead. No, you're going to grow into it. Just grow into it. Grow into it. But unless you're doing it, you ain't going to ever get there. Huh? Unless you're believing for the things that God's giving you the ability to do now. Unless you're taking, pressing it. I told you before I left, I got to keep the press on it. Well, you do too. If you want to walk with God, you got to keep the press on it. You got to keep it. There cannot be any time for R&R. &R. We'll have forever for that. We'll have forever for that. Now, it's labor for the master. Now, it's lay your life down. Now, it's lose your life. What should a profit a man if he gain the whole world lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For unless you lose your life, you cannot find it. If any man will come after me, let him then deny himself, take up his cross, and do what I do. I decree many souls in your life. Yes. I decree in Jesus' mighty name that everything that you've sowed into this up to this point, that everything that you've learned in God, everything that you've read in the Bible begins to explode upon the seeds. Every seed you've sown in the Spirit begins to produce a great harvest, a great spiritual harvest of heavenly things. In Jesus' name, Lavada Stakuda Patatea.